The DJ Bob Show. Pop culture, past and present. Now, here's your host, DJ Bob. Hey, I'm Bob Runkle. And for as long as I can remember, I've loved pop culture. Despite the challenges I've faced in my life, pop culture has always been there for me. I love talking to people and being a platform for others to share their thoughts, stories. Because if there's one thing I never get tired of, it's seeing driven, talented, and inspiring individuals follow their dreams, no matter what obstacles are in their way. And I know a thing or two about that. Welcome to the DJ Bob Show. I'm DJ Bob. Roll it. Oodle, everyone. Welcome to the DJ Bob Show this week. And we are traveling to Lake Hoo-Ha to reunite cast and crew of Disney's show for preschoolers in the 90s, PB&J Otter. We are joined by show creator Jim Jenkins, along with several cast members, and they will introduce themselves I usually give this long, drawn-out introduction about what we talk about, but you know what? Let's get into it. This was so fun to do, so rewarding. Just enjoy it. Hello, how are you? Hey, how's it going? Hey, hey. Hey, I'm here. Well, how long has this been going on, and why am I late? <laughs> how are you guys doing? Oh, my God. It's been a million years. <laughs> to start this off, like, would you guys like to, like, introduce yourself and talk about your involvement in the show? We haven't been no. rolling this whole time. That no. was gold. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you Chiron something? <laughs> it's a podcast. Uh, well, we'll dub it in post. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll fix it later. Yeah. You could whisper over this part. <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to have to. <laughs> Something. So, okay, here we go. So my name is Jim Jenkins, and um, I got to be a, the um, the creator of this awesome, amazing show uh, called PB&J Otter. And we're so, we're, so th- we're so thankful for it. All right, Adam. Yes, I'm Adam Rose, and uh, I did the voice of Peanut Otter. And that i'm so happy to have you because like i said it's been a while since we've talked i'm i'm so excited for this i i can't even tell you i'm i'm i pb and j um uh, hold a dear place in my heart and uh always will and like i said best job i've ever had so you know you know there were three otters and we we got peanut but we also have jelly here janelle hi i'm was Janelle Slack. I'm now Janelle Wilson. And I uh, did the voice of Jelly Otter. And I can still go pretty high pitched if you need me to. (laughs) Chris, you were like everybody on that show. You and Eddie pretty much did everything. You want to, you want to go, you want to go down your list of who you did? Well, I'm Chris Phillips. And I was, uh, Ernest Otter, Munchie Beaver, Captain Crane, and uh, I guess occasional other characters that would come on. And it was great. I loved it. One of the best jobs. Actually, every jumbo job I've ever done has been just the dream job. And we'll get into that a little later. Like, we'll talk about how you got into it. But one of the other unsung heroes of the voice cast, Mr. Eddie Corbett is here. Hello. Hey, uh, yeah, I'm Eddie Corbich, and um, uh, I got to do three of the Snooties, who were the Poodles. Um, I think Jackie Hoffman was my wife, Georgina, but I was Edward Snooty and Bootsy and Bootsy, the um, the uh, fraternal twins. And and I, I mean, I don't want to say I had a favorite character, but I mean, please, can we all just talk about Flick Duck? I was just so happy to do Flick. And and here's the funny thing about Flick. I know we're just supposed to do this and then shut up, but I'm going to go on. 
the funny thing about Flick was after the second episode, I suddenly realized that if I was going to do the Snooties and Flick in the same episode, I had to do the Snooties first. Because after an, yeah. Yeah. an hour or 45 minutes of, you know, rasping the voice here, I like, I couldn't go up to here and say, Daddy, it just wasn't smooth. <laughs> so I learned that really quickly. And, and it was, it was, everybody was just great with it. Um, and like you, Chris, every now and then they, they throw us another, like you're going to be the ride operator in the fair. <laughs> yeah. So that was fun too. That was I remember great. once I was on Doug too. I remember once, I was locked in a closet with Skeeter and Patty, and I was a parrot. I was like, <laughs> so that was fun, too. Anyway, all right. It's funny. Fred and I usually get parrot jobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can't have PB&J without the music. Fred and Dan, well, I pretty much explained, but tell, tell us a bit more about your relationship and how the music came to me. Well, you know, I mean, it was, uh, well, I'm Dan Sawyer, by the way. Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> so music composer and music producer for the series, along with Fred Newman, who you will meet in a minute. And um, we, we tried to create a whole musical world for the show that didn't sound like another show. So you hear things like accordions, and mandolins and a lot of bluegrass type instruments, but used in a little more mellow way. And then of course the songs, I have to thank my partner, Fred Newman. He's just a genius at writing lyrics and everything else. And uh, it was a tight schedule because we had to write, I believe four songs per week or maybe eight, I can't remember. It was a lot of me. I'd, I'd forgotten how much music, but it was really kind of wall to wall music. Dan and I go way back to Mickey Mouse Club, where, uh, and this would be in the mid, mid, or early 90s. And uh, I, could, I could make my face and Dan could play the chord. And it's it really the communication. And I mean, yeah, he would hit something going, go ahead. I'm, and I would, I would go, I would do a face of hurting me a little more. And he'd go, he'd make this minor seventh diminished thing. And we bonded then and we worked through Doug, very, various Doug seasons. And, uh, and when it came to this, I, I, it was odd because most of the shows I'd worked on, I had done, uh, oh, this is Fred Newman, by the way. Sorry. Uh, I just jumped. But Dan doesn't sing his own praises, but Dan really was the producer. And, and he, he's an actor with whatever instrument he's playing and he can play keyboards. He can play guitar. He can make all of them talk and act. And I just would be directing him in terms of tones and stuff. I might've written lyrics. I might've written, written, uh, I would, I, I'm very vocal. So there's a lot of the, uh, that's all, that's all choral things that I, that Dan and I worked on, but I always, is a, is a vocal person sound, person that makes, you know, <laughs> sounds with my voice. Uh, I think, I noticed something recently that when I'm listening, my tongue is actually moving because I'm like shaping what I'm hearing with like, the, if I was going, to, I don't know. So I, I listen that way. Dan could catch that and do it and bring it into full orchestral score, which is, I mean, what kind of partnership? That's a dream thing. And then to be, I'm, who's right below me, looking at Jim, Jim having these characters and having, you know, say, what if we do a lot of, you know, play with words, you know, the oodle and those, jumping off those. I love that, what it makes your mouth do, especially for young kids. They love bubble, dibble, all, all those kind of things. So we'd work those in there. Uh, Jim being open to that, integrating and saying yes in. And I think what you said before, all of you were saying, it was this big yes and. Everybody could throw things in. No one, no, nothing got batted out as negative. Like, okay, all right, what about, oh, what about this? And it just, it was one of those jobs. When that happens, you know, it's magic. And I really forgot about it until I, uh, I watched yesterday episodes and went, oh my God, this is fantastic. I mean, it's, it was cheerful. It was real. It was, it was eccentric. I just thought the voice casting was, was quite brilliant. And to listen to this where it really was this little community and, and, you know, open, you know, as a, 
young person, I'm talking too much, right? The rest of us got nothing, so it's okay. <laughs> Make me leave the meeting. Thinking about it yesterday was just amazing uh, that how, how much happened so right on that show. And that really comes from the top down. He, he, Jim chose the right people and got the right people in the room. And it just sort of crackled, you know. Uh, that's it. Now I'll be quiet. Yeah, and that's, that's really interesting that you're talking about, like, the special kind of carefree nature of the show. Because while I was prepping for this, I pulled up the Christmas episode. And the fact that you dealt with such, like, it was so melancholy, but so fun at the same time. And that was really the nature of the show. Like, it was easygoing, but it had these serious tone sometimes and kids kids need to really feel emotions like you can't hide if something's going wrong you can't hide it from kids but you can't you also can't highlight it and i think you you guys did a brilliant job of that and the writers too jim you want to talk a little bit about your writing staff yeah, I was just making a note so I don't forget it. Um, well, it's, it, you know, the writing, uh, we spent a lot of time. We, we made sure in the schedule that we had um, adequate time to get a script right. And um, we had the honor, the privilege of um, getting to work with Eric Weiner. Um, this was pre-Dora, the Explorer days. Um, and Eric was nimble. You know, he was able to get in there when a script uh, wasn't quite clicking with what we were trying to always establish in this series, he, we just, you know, clamped down and we get it written and get it ready before we could send it to, to you guys to do magic. But um, to me, the, 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 written, the written word, as much as that came from design, you know, in terms of my background, to me, the story, the way it's written was what steered everything. So um, I don't know, I give a lot of credit to Eric Weiner and um, we had a great team of writers. I wish I could rattle off their names, but uh, you know, time. But uh, it, was a, it was a hard, uh, it's a hard part of doing a show, but it's extremely satisfying. And, you know, like I said, like so many kids shows around that time kind of played it safe and you guys never did. I mean, there were so many references to pop culture that was so indirect to the audience at the time, but now I look back and I'm like, oh, that's what they were talking about. That's so great. I, I As a kid, I watched Rocky and Bullwinkle. And, there were, and my folks would watch it with me, and they would laugh at things, and I got the cadence of the joke, but didn't always get the joke. And then years later, I would find myself at a, reading a book or, or, or seeing something go, oh, that's what they're saying. Uh, and, you know, that, that to me is great. So, you know, Janelle and Adam, you want to talk about how you became part of the Otter family? Sure. Um, I mean, it was really just an audition. <laughs> I was doing, I was involved in a lot of theater and I made it to New York and was on Broadway and got an agent and had an audition. and. You know, I think it's happened after that. Uh, that's just kind of how it worked for me. Nothing too crazy. Um, but I, I like, just like all of you guys are talking about, such fond memories of looking back doing that. I agree with Adam, best job in the world. I have stepped out of showbiz for a while and I've always said, I think the only way I would go back is if I just voiceovers because that was, it was so fun. It was just a completely different experience. And just being able to see a show from simple on characters to them now merging voices and you do the, the looping and, and to see the finished product at the end, it was fascinating to me. I was 12 maybe when we started. So that was just wonderful to be a part of. I felt like I won the lottery. <laughs> I, I remember hearing some ridiculous number of kids that auditioned. Um, I think originally I, 
I came in, if I remember correctly, I read for, was the character Scooch? Yeah, and I originally read for Scooch, and I was, that was the role I wanted to play because I wanted to do some like raspy, like, I wanted to like do voices. And um, Jim, I think you were like, no, uh, take this role and read this one. And so I remember going into the green room at Home and Sound, and there was a, like a monologue and a little drawing of Peanut. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I just used my, my regular voice and, and then I won the lottery. <laughs> and that was it. I, I mean, I, I was surrounded by incredibly talented people and, and, and that was really my first like foray in, into the professional world at all. Um, and, and again, it was just like, it couldn't, couldn't have been a, a, a more welcoming and like warm experience to start a showbiz career. <laughs> I wanna, let me jump in here. Um, Adam, you are right. You were surrounded by some of the best people. I'm looking at a lot of them right now. Uh, some of the best people on earth. Uh, but in terms of um, you and Janelle are at the core. You're the, you're the center. You're going to lead us through the whole universe. And it had to be real kids. It had to be the heart and the soul and the sound of authentic real kids. And it, that is so much more than getting a kid. You, all of you are actors. You know that it is not as easy as just waltzing up to the mic. And, you know, you're reading words and, they, and you've got to make them sound like they're coming out of, the, of a regular kit. And you too had it, you had something in, when you could hear it that came across as authentic. The other thing is, and you had that, even you today, you had this sort of laid back nasally sound which is awesome. You know, you're sort of never quite impressed. You're kind of, I'm not dancing. You know, you can go ahead and dance on me. And Janelle has got that energy, that sharp edge on her voice and just right there. Come on, we can do this. Come on. And that chemistry is just classic comic duo. And it was executed. You guys were awesome. Oh man. It was just like bringing back so many memories. Um, I honestly think that doing PB and J, I mean, it taught me everything about comedy, I think. I mean, you know, I, I, I learned a lot from watching things, that, but, but in terms of my own performance and timing, um, when I would get Kent to laugh on the other side of the glass um, and he would just be like banging on the table, um, that was my first experience, like making someone laugh um, uh, with words that somebody else wrote, you know? And, and so I think it really did teach me how I can use my voice and timing and all sorts of things that, that I, I, who, I don't even know if I'd still be doing comedy right now if I didn't have that experience. So um, I, I, I'm, I love everything you just said, Jim. And, you know, so Eddie, Eddie and Chris, you guys were assigned so many characters, but where did it start? Like, like, how did you get the audition? And, you know, how did all those characters come about? Well, mine's, mine's pretty, I, I think mine's easy. Um, I remember being in Houston with um, Showboat, the national tour of Showboat. I was doing national tour of Showboat. And I was already on Doug. And, um, and everybody was just so wonderful. Every city I would go into they would find a studio there and I would go in and record. Um, and now that I think about it, you guys, thank you so much. That must've been really expensive. Sorry. Um, but uh, I remember I had a cassette recorder and they said, we're trying out this new cartoon and it's gonna be aimed at uh, younger kids and they're all animals. And I'm like, great. And I remember sitting in my Houston apartment before the show and just doing it on the cassette recorder thinking, this sounds horrible. This is horrible. It's horrible. Anyway, I did like, we were given all these, right, Chris? We we're given so many. We just had, I just did like eight of them and then, um, or something like that. And then it thinking, well, 
you know, if nothing else happens, it's I've got I've got Alan Moose Leach. Well, that's really wonderful. And then it came back that they wanted four, and I was just it's like the lottery. This is exactly what Adam said. You win the lottery because to think, oh my gosh, not only am I working with the same creative people, but yet I'm going to get to work with the same creative people on another level and a deeper level, and it's going to go on. And so, yeah, I I I just can't stop smiling. That's how I got it. For me, um, I guess I first auditioned for the original Doug for Nickelodeon. When I got there, all the good parts had been taken. I said, oh, I, I'd love to read for Doug. No, uh, Skeeter, no. It just all down the line. I ended up reading for the guy sitting at home watching it on TV and got the part. I <laughs> didn't end up uh, in the original Doug. But, but uh, apparently the audition went well enough that I ended up in uh, Hoyt and Andy's Sports Bender, the old faded Hoyt and Andy Sports Bender. We did the, the entire series, or at least a season, and it, it unfortunately didn't fly. But I had so much fun doing that. Uh, Jim was directing a lot of that. And we would start laughing so much, we'd be crying laughing. At just turns of a phrase or voices or just, you know, having a blast. And the relationship, I guess, started there. And uh, we, I guess, when... What happened, I forget what happened next, that Doug went to Disney, I think, then I was on that. And uh, thanks to Billy West moving to LA and all, but um, so I was on that, did a lot of voices on that, and then PB&J started. And I don't even remember the auditioning process or if it was just that, well, you know, one thing parlayed into the next kind of thing. Uh, there were certain characters I suppose I read for, but, uh, that was a blast. And I didn't get to sing. We didn't have music so much in the other uh, shows. So doing the music was so great for this. I, I, I remember I would get these songs and I had to learn a bunch of songs in two days. And I was like, I'll never learn this. I'll never learn this. But the songs are so catchy and they worked so well. I found myself remembering them very quickly. And, um, and Dan would be in the studio also with a keyboard, which is a nice help. But uh that was so that was my it was one cartoon to the next into the next and uh i finally got here <laughs> yeah, um and what i love about that is that jumbo jim you've created such a family that everybody you never forget about anybody you always you always included them in your project no matter what it was and that's kind of the idea of PB and J too, and that being being inclusive and including everybody. Was that something from the beginning that you wanted to include in the show? Inclusiveness and all that stuff. No, we hate, we hate that. No, we, in, inclusion really is at the core of of um, everybody gets to come along. And we wanted to run a company that's tried to treat, you know, the people that work there that way. And we wanted it to come across on the screen. So, of course, when you get to know um, the various folks that can do all these amazing voices and skills, you want to keep it going because it is it does feel like a family. Um, and the stories, too. In fact, um, Bob, you mentioned the, the Christmas special. It actually and I know you know this, but it wasn't Christmas. It was the story of the ice moose. And you know, I have to say, everybody gets to come to this story. This story is for everybody and whatever your, you know, your sort of specific kind of celebrations or whatever, you're invited. And um, that was, I think that theme happened over and over and over. You know, it was, it's, the story was always about community and everybody gets to come to the table. Well, that's what, when watching it, I watched, I binge watched you know, little segments on YouTube. There are probably 30 different segments and some of them are cut short, some, you know, all, you know, all different fragments and things. But with the COVID head on this, what jumped out is community. And it, it jumped out that how do you, and that's what we're all arguing about right now. What is our community? You know, and, and that show said kids coming into the world, this is the community. These are things that happen. This is sadness. This is happiness. These are outsiders. These are things. And it, it, it was 
even more brilliant then, I mean, yesterday than it was years ago. But I, I truly believe, Jim, on every production that I've been a little part of with you, that every single person in that, in that world, I don't care who they are, if they're, they're you know, the receptionist or whatever, everyone gets that sense of community that you, you put on there. And it, it's, it comes through the media, whatever it is. Uh, because if you don't adhere to that, then you really, you, you, you would know you've got to discipline yourself and, and bring your best stuff there. Don't all the negative stuff that goes out and everyone's yes ending everybody else. And I think that you made the process so good. That is so rare. And, you know, as I'm going to mime smoke now, you know, you know, like it, as we go through and get older and do shows, you realize there's a lot of that negativity all around in shows. But when you, when you, any of us in, in all these, uh, the, the, the holiday, uh, the Hollywood squares here, the, uh, this, this phone call, um, zoom call in that we all got that, that this, oh, this is, this is different. This is a really, this is a process that we're welcomed into we're, and we're lucky to be here. And we still do that 20 years later. We, we, that we go back to that. That's pretty great. That doesn't happen. So thank you. I felt that with the actors too, even, I mean, I only ran into Chris a couple times at Pullman. Uh, I think I recorded with Eddie maybe once or twice, but not what it was. If I, if whenever we, there, we just, I felt that like, just, oh, he's my dad in the tune. Like it was so fun. <laughs> and with Eddie, oh, it's slick. I mean, he's my best friend in the cartoon. And it was, I felt that just amongst us voice actors, even though we hardly ran into each other. <laughs> no, I want to second that. I mean, I remember coming from, I was, I was doing some Broadway shows at that point and I was coming from musicals and stuff. And not once did I ever, ever feel that I was the outsider coming in. It was immediate welcome, immediate everything. And Jim, I remember you taking me to, uh, was it Jumbo or Cartoon Pizza at that point? Um, I don't know the name of it, but it was this place. It was it was your it was your offices, and I remember you taking me on a tour to it, and and just walking by cubicle after cubicle where everyone just had a smile on their face and said hello, and um, and all of a sudden the noodle dance started playing over the speakers, and one of the guys got up and danced his way with his mug to get his tea and then danced his way back. And it was just, it's, it was just the best atmosphere. I always wish we could have worked together at the same time. Well, we did at the Christmas party. Remember the Christmas party behind the, the library? Oh yeah, yeah, that was great. Or the holiday party or whatever I, it, it was. But I do remember that. And I remember Adam, the very first time I met you and I, you were like, who are you? And you were with your mom. And I, I said, oh, I, I play Flick and I, I do that. And then I started doing the voices and you were like, well, it's very nice to meet you. And I said, and do, do the voice now for, for Peanut, do your voice. And you had, a, you had a, a chicken finger and you went, I just did. <laughs> 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 because it was you, it was so great. <laughs> that sounds like me. I, yeah. I, I, still to this day, if you see me at a holiday party, I will have a chicken finger in my mouth. Uh, so that hasn't changed. So one of the one of the one of the integral parts of the show was the music. What are some Fred and Dan, what are some of your favorite songs? And then everybody else pipe in. Well, the noodle dance, of course, is like the one people know. But one of, another one of my favorites is the actually the song from the Christmas uh, special that we've been talking about. The um, On the Eve of Hoo Ha Hoo, it's just a beautiful song. The, the kids, you know, Adam and Janelle sang that and they just did a great job. I, I, I don't think I can pick out any favorites there, there's some great ones but yeah they the the ideas for the songs came from the writing in the script sometimes there would be lyrics but most of the time i think uh, i think i wrote and then dan dan and i would go back and forth on them um i remember happy endings they were influenced a lot because dan and i based 
dug on vocals and uh, uh, and the African music that was coming, Lady Smith, Black Mombasa, and the music, uh, Soweto music and so forth, the guitar, dee -dee 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 -dee, that's all sort of African, super, all, the, just all the sort of influences in there. That under came underneath this, there's a little bit of African in there, but put that with, with uh, roots country music. And that's what we felt that it was somewhere in there. And when we would hit, and Dan could make the two go together. So I, a melody could be a little bit this way and it would push it back. So it was somewhere in between sort of somewhere it would, you hadn't heard it before, but a little bit different. And it was, it was a great discovery pro process. I, I, I missed that I wasn't in the, the vocal records because most of the stuff I'm, I'm used to being a, a vocal guy, but uh, so I missed that. I really did miss that. But so we're working, we're chasing you guys, you know, we're, we're doing the, the music band could pretty much master any, any, sound that we I, uh, he could play any instrument and so the orchestrations became really interesting and I might give advice or this or like what do we do you know but uh, even if you hear the theme song you hear the little the little the flute it's really it, it's got it sounding like an ocarina and it sounds almost like it could be it could be Asian it could be African it could be you know a uh, Irish uh, tin whistle so it, it, in, in the, the instrumentation, that was all Dan, just like amazing stuff. And, I, and, while, and while I'm here, I just thought of a memory that Janelle told me about recording one of the specific songs. Do you want to jog Dan's memory with that one? Was it the worst song that I've ever recorded in entire life, that one? <laughs> I had memorized some of the notes wrong. If Dan, if you recall this joyous day in the studio that we were probably there for hours longer than we should have been. I had memorized the whammy clammy song wrong and I could not sing those notes right. And it's interesting because I went down a rabbit hole of watching PB&J songs the other day with my kids and whammy clammy happened to be one of them. And I could hear it in the recording and I was like, oh man, that's like the worst I've ever done. But it was, it was, it was a great memory to have now. It was miserable living through it, but I had memorized the notes wrong. I could get it out ahead, so I couldn't record it right. I think they finally had me just like do it without music. And it was just like <laughs> really flat toned because I just couldn't do it right. I'm sorry about that. And all these years later. Janelle did a great job throughout the whole series. Dan, I have a question. Th that that I, I in listening to the music, what I'm un I, well for all you guys that are singing it, it's so much faster than any music I ever heard recorded. Everything is about like a third faster. I mean, in, in, there there's a lot of little in my head thinking back. They were written slower, but when they came out, and I guess it's the timing of. Of animation and have the stories and go. You just got to. You got to verse chorus, verse chorus. Get out of here! Boom. And, and 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 they're doing words that are hard to say. You know, uh, oodly noodly oh, but 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 you know, it's, it, you, nonsense words and stuff. And you got it done. But it's amazing to me. I it, did. You remember that being difficult to sing some of those? Any of you? So, some of them were a little tongue twistery, I think. But I I don't know you. You guys would probably remember better, like what the experience was like for like me singing. The, I was too busy shoving food in my face the whole time. <laughs> so <laughs> chicken fingers mainly. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I always loved, I always loved um, recording the songs, but I, I definitely remember feeling like Janelle, you also had like the Broadway background. And so I just felt like I, I was in Janelle's shadow when it came to the singing part of the show. You know what I mean? I really did. I was like, I was like, I'll never live up to Janelle. <laughs> I remember one time there was a beautiful song. I think it was Goodnight Lake Hoo-Ha or something. And I was supposed to sing it as Captain Crane. And I thought, oh my God, this song is beautiful. And I've got to sing it in a voice like this. And I, thought, I remember saying to Dan, I, I'm going to ruin your song. He's like, no, 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 it'll be great. And I heard it not that long ago. And 
I thought, wow, that we pulled that off. That was great. And uh, I never thought that Captain Crane. Yeah. I just listened to it. Oh, really? You're looking out over the water. Yeah. yeah. So sweet the way you were just plucking that, that ukulele. Oh, here's something else I want to throw on. This is for you, Adam. We, we had time pressure uh, on this show, all kinds of time pressures of making deadline. But the biggest one I think we had was your voice changing. What are we going to do? Pitch it up? Are we going to have you pitch yourself up? Are we going to make you shut up? I, you know, what are we going to do? Re recast me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one thing I did not want to do, but uh, I just remember toward the end of the series, we did 65, you know, half hours. So you, I remember stories, but you, we were racing the, the puberty clock with you. I remember towards the end, if I remember correctly, there, we did start pitching me up, right? Um, by the end of it. I mean, it, it did, did I get it canceled? <laughs> Am I the reason that happened? And that's really what this call is about. Thanks a lot. I put all of you out of a job. Yoko of the group. Exactly. We just we just wanted to bring it up now. We've been holding this grudge for years. <laughs> oh my God! Someone's at my door. <laughs> um, but what was what what did bring the series to a close? Was it just a decision Disney made, or what did it have something to do with um, my? my not sounding like a kid anymore <laughs> just in in the biz of show of, of children's shows um in this country 65 half hours was considered a run and unless you're just a spongebob just runaway hit 65 gets you there because then you can strip it into every day and then you just start thinking about kids aging out of the series and all that in europe it's like i think it's 55 episodes no 52 episodes wasn't there wasn't there something also about the syndication of it all like if we had gone past that they i, I don't know like it, it it would have been more of an investment for disney or something like that it, it was only the investment of 65 hours is a lot of money you know i don't even know off the top of my head many many millions of dollars and 65 for a good solid as pb and j was a solid performer um and and it, and it ran its full course so we got everything they had planned to, to do they they let us do um so wait so bob you i i, I don't want to forget this um so you were talking about how it was there any problems that we had or any fun stuff that we can remember with the music and everything, the, the the only thing that I remember is is that because I was doing a, um, the Snooties, that sometimes the song would be in a key that would fit um, Ootsy, but not Bootsy. So luckily, most of the time I could just pop up the octave and do and do and do Bootsy up here, which was really really fun. Um, but I remember the best party ever. It's the best party ever. We're all together with friends. The with, which was, which jumped up. I remember, I remember having like a brain aneurysm because I couldn't get the exact, up the octave, I couldn't get her right on pitch. And I remember Ken after like 20 takes going, you know, we're going to be fine. Everybody's going to be singing at this point. And like, but I will know, I will know in my grave, I will know that I did not hit, but it was like, I can't do it now because I'll blow everybody up. But it was like, it's the best party ever. We're all together. It was like so insane, but really fun. And then, then, and then I want to say, you guys, the actors, do you, you've done looping with like real, real acting humans. The looping to cartoons was so like bizarre at first for me. I was like, how can I match my lips with just a beak or something? And I remember we were at your store, Chris. We were at Mr. Otter's store and Ootsie and Bootsy came and, he, and you said, what do you want? And Bootsy said, all this, all this junk. We want to buy it. No, all this stuff. We want to buy it. And they had animated the little poodle teeth over the little poodle bottom lip. So you actually said stuff. And then, and then Kent said, well, project one or whatever it is, 
says that we can't use the word stuff. We're changing it to junk. I don't know if that's really what happened, but they changed the word from stuff to junk. So I had to go in and say, all this junk, we want to buy it. But k and are so, so we came up with me going, and I don't know, I've listened to it and I'm like, it does work. We came up with me going, all this junk, we want to buy it. It was... But it was it was fun and it goes by so quickly that nobody but us would ever know. But it's just it you know what I mean? It was so much fun. All right. Well that would happen every now and then a character would finish this sentence, his or her sentence, and then say one more thing. Uh the animators would draw one more mouth movement. You'd have to, you know, on the fly kind of come up with something in post and or or you would read the line happy and then they drew the person angry or, or something and you had to change the whole. That to me, that was a lot of fun. I always loved that challenge. As a kid, I would, uh, well, when I got, when we started getting videotape, video decks, I'd turn off the sound and buddies of mine would come over and we would just ad lib over TV. So that was early training, I guess, for that kind of stuff. I think I, think I was just always so excited to see the cartoon like come together that I, I you know, I wasn't even thinking about, you know, uh, the, the difficulty of actually doing the looping. I was just like in awe that I was actually watching the cartoon finally. Yeah, yeah that's my voice. <laughs> that's me, that's me. Did you guys ever like watch yourself on TV? Every chance I get. When are we yeah. on? Like, were you sitting there Saturday morning or whenever we on? Like... For Doug, I woke up every Saturday morning at bowl of cereal. I was... Suddenly I was a kid, but now I'm watching me. It was and you know what? I was watching Doug too. I uh, was watching you also. And if a promo came on right before the show and one of my characters said something like Roger or something, I'd go, oh, yeah. The story that Adam told me like a while ago, because we, again, we've talked. When you first met Chris and he was the voice of a certain I, I mean, I don't remember the story. I just remember being like, Chris was probably the person I was starstruck by um, uh, because he, you know, I was already a huge Doug fan um, and uh, um, uh, you too, Fred, um, and, and, and just... Me too. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then I found out you did face as well. I mean, I was just the prime age. You were you were my rock star. You know what I mean? And I and then you got to be I, I got to be your kid. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I you know every time I eat peanut butter and banana sandwiches, I think of you, Chris. Oh my God! So many people have come up to me about that song. Peanut butter and banana. That will be in my head forever. There's no reason that that sticks in a lot of people. It's the peanut butter that sticks in the back of your mind. It's the one that I always bring up to Chris, to Chris too. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's crazy. I don't know why that that's such a like earworm. I like the the, the one. Um, I'm waiting. What was it? I'm waiting. Yeah, I'm waiting. They would just give me words, lyrics, and I would make up something right there. That was, and that was so much fun. Didn't get paid anything extra, but I didn't care. I it was like, hey, this is, this is the dream job, you know. I, I love it. When you enter a kid's life, you know, if they're, if they're that age, that is such a formative time that years later, when, you know, I, I remember there was a guy who, it was Officer Don who ran the Popeye Club in Atlanta, Georgia on you know, four to five o'clock after school, I watched this and they ran Popeye cartoons and he's an officer. I met him, maybe I was 16. And I remember taking my shirt and rolling it up. I, I mean, I'm a 16 year old and I met Officer Don. And it was like, Officer Don, oh my, Don Kennedy was his name. And I was, no one could have impressed me more than that. And I don't care who it was, but, that was, but, but so it makes me very reverential going into doing something with kids because you're making differences. You are, you are impressing in a way. It's such a, you know, it's a, it's a, I don't, I don't want to get too priestly on you, but it feels like, you know, you've been given a gift. You got to handle it 
you know, well, man, you know, and you know, Adam, you, what you're just saying about Chris, that's, that's that people are feeling that about you, you know, that, that like, that's, that's the, it's, it, it's, it's kind of sacred there. And it's a sacred trust that, you know, it been, and no one protects that trust better than Jim Jenkins. You know, he really, you know, I think he's, 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 he's pointing to that saying, Hey, this is a special time. We got to, you know, honor them. Yeah. Did I get too heavy there? No, no. I, no, I was I, I'm of the same mind. You, yeah, you, and that, that's the kind of that's the kind of stuff we like to hear because honestly, my reason for for getting you guys together because when I look the show up, people see this show from a kid perspective, and that's it. I know that there are people behind this show, and I wanted to connect you guys. So. Bob, I have a question. I have a question for you, Bob. So, how, what, how old were you when you were watching PB and J? I was. It was only in reruns, but that was only because I didn't get Disney Channel until I was eight, eight years old. So it took me a while to find it, but I'm glad that I did. Or oh, wait, glad you did too. Yeah. And the thing I wanted to tell you guys was that there were so like with PB and J specifically, life lessons were such a big part of the show. Is there any life lesson from the show that really stuck out with you like years later? I mean of course you're not thinking about PB and J every day, but like is there anything that just sticks with you like wow they actually talked about that. Just the experience of us working together even more so than the actual, the show itself, because that's where, you know, my involvement was so heavy, just working with all of you guys. And, uh, and, and I was very, you know, I also like Fred, I, when I was a kid, I, all the kid stuff or radio or things really made a major impact on me. I recorded a lot of stuff as a kid uh, from commercial music, you know, oddball stuff I, that other friends of mine, I think must've thought I was nuts, but I would get them into, recordings that I would do. So it's kind of natural that I would do this, but it, I, I don't know. I think I'm sort of going around a long way of saying that it really, you know, kids stuff makes a big impact on, on a lot of kids. And I feel that that's so important that you take that with you for the rest of your life. And this was such a great show for that between the, the humor, the music, the voices, the stories. I mean, I'm very happy to be a part of it. Very proud. And thank you. <laughs> yeah, really wonderful things happen all the time. Um, I, I, like I said, sometimes I go on the road a lot and I do stuff and there are kids in the company and it, it doesn't happen so much like in the past two years, three years, but before then it happened all the time where I would just be, because Flick is with Eddie all the time. Uh, and I would just come out with like, cheese and quackers, oh my God. And I just like do that. And so many times in the hallway of a theater, I would do it and the dressing rooms would open and the little kids' faces would pull out and go, you've not, you don't, you know, you sound like this cartoon character I know. And I went, oh, really? Who? And I mean, that's a magnificent time. But, but Adam, the best thing that ever happened was about 11 years ago. I was, I was doing something out of town. And one of the kids in the company was like having a, like a nervous breakdown. And I walked in and I'm like, what is going on, guys? What is going on? Everything's going to be fine. And they're like, no, the library is going to close. And I have this book here that I've got to return to the library. And by the time we're done with the matinee, it'll be closed. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, you pay a little bit. I can't afford to pay money. My parents are making me pay money. And I'm, and I'm like, I don't know where this is going. And I said, so, you know what? If it's, if it's today, it'll be today. They can't charge you if you get it in today. You can take it after the library closed, puts it in the book drop. No, 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 no. I watched this cartoon once where, where the character went and he was running up and the library was closed. And I was like, oh, my God, what cartoon was this? And they're like, well, the librarian made him work it off, which was fun because he liked to. And I'm like, but what cartoon was this? There were these animals on Lake Hoo-Ha. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so it's the episode where Peanut was running with the library book 
and she had just closed it and said, sorry, Peanut. And she said, but you can work at the library. But to come to come full circle, like in a completely different situation, it was mind blowing. So I mean, we we really did leave an impression on people. Yeah, we did. <laughs> what I really find interesting is with PB and J, like there are lots of fan commit, but for some people, they have no idea because at that time, Disney Channel wasn't basic cable yet. You know, so it's like for this group of kids, it because the other thing too is that the demographic, like in the marketing materials for the show, they always said a show for little kids. So if any, so life lessons are important for anybody, but for the preschool set, it's more important. So like. For Jim, was it difficult for you to write for a preschool audience? It makes a big difference when you have kids. <laughs> um, and if you notice about the, sh the shows we got to make, Doug um, is really memories of being a kid. That's what that was. And it, ha it, it was developed pre um, getting married or starting a family, whatever. Um, PB&J started when our oldest, who's now mid-20s, was in diapers. And, um, and so you understand what Baby Butter would do and whatever. And by the time the, the show was up and going, we had, um, you know, kids in the target, two kids in the target audience. And so it's, it's every day. You're spending time and listening and uh, interacting. So I would say it. It would have been a lot harder, let's put it that way, without that help. When you asked the question earlier, uh, Bob, about anything you remember, it was the noodle dance for me. And it was sometime not that long ago, uh, it's, I mean, during COVID, where I'm sitting here at a, this, this exact desk, and I'm sitting for hours, and I'm, I'm trying to work through writing or whatever problems there were. And I started getting up in the middle of my desk, push the chair back, and I would get up and start, you know, and I'd, I'd just start, just start moving. And, and I went, oh, it's a noodle dance. You know, it's like that, that, that integrating your body, forgetting about, you know, thinking you're going to think something through. No, you got to get the whole, the whole, this is the whole thinking thing. The whole thing works together in this very big way. And that was, that was, it was a noodle dance. I and mean, it was like, hey, yeah, that was such a great thing about solving problems. Stop. Don't try to, you know, gut it out. Get away from it. Do something different and cut, sit back down. And that's helped me a lot. And, and, uh, it, and, and it was reminded of that when I watched and saw the noodle dance. Went, yeah, that's exactly what, get the body going into it. So yeah, you were way ahead of the Cleared your mind. Yeah. 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 You know, your mind will follow this, you know, loosen up, just yeah. get, you know, get away from it. You can, yeah. You know, um, predictability was another thing that they encouraged us to, get to rely on, which is really a running gag. So that um, Janelle, you, you know, it's like, it's like, come on, let's do the noodle dance. And you're, you're going to be all in. And Adam, you're going to be like, um, I'll do some thinking, but I'm not dancing. And that was I'll noodle, but I won't dance. Running gag. And I just saw a clip. Somebody edited back to back all of those. To see all the variations of that gag, um, and it was, oh, but I think kids. Oh, I want to see that for sure. <laughs> yeah. What are some of What are some of your favorite episodes of the show? Favorite moments? Like start with um, Adam and Janelle. God, I have no idea. I I I should have done some some research before doing this and and watched a few episodes but my my memories of the episodes are 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 are, are more I, I i have images in my head and i don't even remember the the moments um off the top of my head i do for some reason the thing that like sticks out to me is a song that we sang about cleaning up um, I 
don't know why that sticks in my head and I probably couldn't even hum it for you right now. Um, that good, clean fun. Good, clean, good, clean fun. That's it. Good, clean fun. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have like little fragments in my head that jump around there. Partially because I made you react to it that one time. Did you send me that clip? I sent you that clip, remember? Maybe that's why it's stuck in my head. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I. I I honestly have more memories from like being in that studio and in Pullman Sound than, <laughs> than the actual show itself, oddly enough. Like I remember meeting uh, Jerry Stiller in, uh, at Pullman Sound. Me too. Because <laughs> he was doing uh, Teacher's Pet and and I was so excited about that because I love Jerry Stiller. I don't know. I just rem I remember uh, so many of the experiences. I, I, I don't even have a lot of the memories from the show itself stuck in my head. That's funny. I remember meeting Jerry Stiller too. He thought he knew me. He kept saying, I know, I know you from somewhere. I'm like, unless my TV is working two ways, we've never met before. I mean, but he was the greatest and I was so excited. <laughs> so Janelle, what, what memories do you have? What sticks out? I definitely think the songs were a huge part of my love for the show. Um, I remember a lot of the songs still. <laughs> and and I think of just the beautiful messages that were in. We got nominated a lot for for um but not I, not I can't think of anything that we actually I campaigned for a daytime Emmy and nothing ever <laughs> came up. So. We won the hearts of kids everywhere. That's, that's what really counts. That's right. What people don't realize is that we seldom were in the same room together. That uh, it is, and what it took is that uh, a musical director there that would, would get the exact tone in the, across people coming in. But then uh, as importantly, or maybe more importantly, is that, that, you know, these are, these are fictional characters. You're not looking at anything and you're imagining you're building a sandcastle on a beach. And it's blown away. And that director has to set you up. Jim, brilliant. The most brilliant uh, uh, sound voice director. And it's different than acting director because you can use your face. You can do all that. No, this is just how do you back someone into feeling a moment and, and do it across sessions that are be days apart, even, even, you know, country, you know, the whole country apart. You, you got you to gotta make it consistent where those two go together perfectly. And it's a really subtle art. And a lot of people, uh, you know, stage directors think they can go in and do that. No, Act, you know, acting with the voice, with no visuals, just the voice. It's the catch in the voice. It's the little groan at the end of a, of a, of a vowel, you know, whatever. That, that, and Jim would know how to get you in there. That it's a, it's a, a, a part of animation that I think is not often known. You guys, do, do you remember, Jim, when we went uh, it was my first time ever um, visiting LA and we went, there was, I, I think it was for the, was it for the premiere maybe or for something? And we were like at the Beverly Hills hotel or something. And it was like the fanciest event. Where was it? We were at the Ritz Carlton in Pasadena. Yeah. <laughs> it was very fancy. <laughs> the Ritz Carlton. In Pas and I remember it was like right during, right during NBC upfronts or something like that. And like the entire cast of Seinfeld was there. I don't know. I just remember like that being the most glamorous thing I had ever done in my <laughs> life. And then Jim, you, you brought us up on stage to introduce us at this like incredible party that we were at and we showed a clip of the show. I mean, those are the things that stick out in my mind so much. These incredible experiences. I'd forgotten that. That's, that's amazing. Cause that was, one of the things I wanted to bring up today when we spoke, but Chris and Eddie, favorite moments, favorite scenes, episodes, the whole bit. I think well, for as far as episodes, I mean, it, it all goes like Adam kind of said, it's not so much, it's the lines. It's the lines that I remember doing, the, the special lines. There was a, a time when they got lost in an amusement park. And I was the, a weasel, I think, an operator. And I remember, would the parents of Peanut and Jelly Otter please come <laughs> to the station? 
You know that? These kids really miss their mom and dad. I mean, just great like that. Um, uh, the, the, I do remember the ice moose. I love the ice moose. I remember Flick at one time going, you're going to have me race against this, this, and a baby? There's no way it can win. No way. I mean, fun stuff like that. And then when I learned to fly, when I tried to learn to fly with practice makes perfect. Now, I never sang on that song. I never sang on the song. It was just me climbing the stream and falling down. But I remember stuff like that. Um, and then, it, Bob, how can I make it make you understand that that it's so much more than just the episodes? The the moments that happened would would not happen without the episodes or the stuff. But but I mean, walking in a Barnes and Noble and seeing a book and going, I, mouth sounds? What's that? And then it's Fred Newman. Or, or the weekly, the weekly telephone call with Dan Sawyer to go over the music and to figure it out. Um, the, the, the mail coming with the storyboards. Um, the fact that Adam and I got to really be in the room together more than anybody else, and they would order food for us. That was wonderful. Um, um, Chris Phillips being, I, I can't tell. I can't tell you how your smile and your calm confidence just helped me in the business of, of everything, just being there. It just so, you were, You're such an earnest daughter. You're so great. Um, and Janelle, didn't we meet one time in Boston when I was doing 42nd Street and you came to see the show or something somewhere and I saw you and you were grown up and I was like, oh my God, what happened? So it's all these little moments that I remember. Um, I cannot, I cannot tell you the biggest moment with Jim Jenkins. Um, two stand out. One, they were going to do Doug live at one of the Disney parks, and I came down to pitch the show with Jim there. Um, and it was me, and it, it, it was a lovely thing. I sang some songs. Uh, I was never going to get cast. I never cared about getting cast, but just to be in the room watching how. Jim did the presentation was amazing life experience. And then I'll end by saying that, that my very, 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 very first time hearing your voice, Jim Jenkins was on a phone when you had me audition for Alan Moose Leach. And you said, I have these two nephews and they're twins, but they've got, the only way you can tell them apart is by a, a speech impediment. And could you come up with something? And I don't know if you even remember that. And you said one of them is very, very scientific. So it's not robotic, but it's very scientific. And all of a sudden, he, you said something like Hermie the Elf from, from Rudolph. And I said, not happy in my work, I guess. And you said, yeah, make that more robotic. Oh, oh, all right. You are correct. Da, 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 da. Now, can you, can you transform it? Just a little bit, and I went okay, and then all the tongue got lazy, and you just go, "That's it, wonderful for you." And you went, "Thanks, that's all we need." And when I got home to Astoria, it was on the answering machine. We want you to be on. It's those moments that are so magnificent and that are life changing. So thank you. Wow. Gosh. Thank you. That's the direction right there. That's the little. He knows how to nudge. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, because when I was going to do the voice of Ernest, I didn't know where to go. And Jim would say, just your own voice, you know, just a little softer or whatever, but just you. And I was, I, I don't do me. <laughs> but it, uh, it was me. <laughs> so kind of cool. The thing that I loved about the show, the voice direction, is that there was such back and forth between characters and it's not and there are many times now where everybody's in different rooms and were there ever group records very few yeah i got to work with jackie hoffman whenever we would do the uh the cranes watchbirds yeah so that was that was always nice so we played off each other and uh had a good rapport so that was always nice I wish we could have all been together. Yeah, Janelle, we we did it a couple times, um, or a few times probably, uh, during 
Yeah, I think yeah. when I recorded most of the first season together, I feel like, and then I started traveling. So I was doing what Eddie did, where they'd find a studio for me wherever, whatever state I was performing in. I remember once there was me, Adam, and Eddie all together. And that's one of my favorite memories of Eddie is seeing him do the voice. I don't remember if it was Flick or Uti and Bootsy, but he was using every body part he could to make that voice come out of his body. And it was the funniest thing. I, I, still, I still visualize it. If it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I, I can see it. And, and you know, when you do get two or three people in a, in a room recording at one time, you get that note that goes, no, 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 don't overlap. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> don't overlap. <laughs> Because we can't get it, you know. They can't overlap. It was great, but do it again. But don't overlap. So if you can't, wait a minute. You can't. You can't overlap the person. So it's like, go. Oh, why are we here together? You know, that's you know, blow the energy down. You know, if that, that was that's that's always a funny thing. Fred, that the funny the funny thing there with me with with Ootsy and Bootsy, they I do a whole scene and have to go back and forth, and that is and finally I think Jim, you said. Um, let's just, we, pro I promise you, it will make it sound like it's, you're talking together, but let's just do all Ootsy and then all Bootsy. And then, and then that's how it was. Cause I was just going back and forth. Do you believe this? No, I don't. I don't understand it. Well, I know what it was just like. But you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. You know, that's amazing. Well, well, anyway. One of the things that I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this was, the one guest star you guys had before the holiday episode, Harry Belafonte. How did that come about? <laughs> Jim. Um, well, backing up, I'm, it, it, philosophically, I really wanted to not make, for whatever headline reasons you, you know, to cast, people that had a name in another way, a star or whatever. I just, I wanted our characters to be what we all focused on. They're real characters, you know, they're real people or real otters or whatever. Um, but we were asked specifically uh, for the Ice Moose special to, you know, we blew the stops out in every direction. I mean, the music, listen to the music in that show, my gosh, the, the scoring of it and all that. But look in the background, there's um, like Christmas lights blinking just about in every shot. That's, those are money shots, you know, because think, still animation. Think about what it takes to make something blink. So we did a lot of that stuff. But we were asked to find a, um, a star. And again, I don't know, maybe to a fault, but I didn't want the star to necessarily eclipse the, 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 the story, the, the purpose of, of telling this story. Um, it's, it's like a new, it's like taking the, the mythology of Santa Claus and, um, you know, giving kids this story that hopefully like, like it's a wonderful life and all the rest of them that'll play forever, you know, is this new little, you know, holiday story. But um, he, he was, Harry Belafonte was approached um, in the uh, casting in LA, of course. And um, when you listen to the Ice Moose and you hear his voice that is kind and soft, but, but strong, uh, it, was, it was the exact right feeling for this, this wise, it, you know, the wisdom of the ages is gonna speak this now and, and, and be this Ice Moose. So it was, it turned out, uh, with, even with misgivings, it turned out perfect. I love that he was who we ended up with. I love that too. And, you know, kind of the deep philosophical question to kind of wrap this up for each of you. What does PB&J mean to you? As a show, as a unit, you know? I mean, for me, it means like youth. You know, I mean, it to me, it represents um, everything about childhood, whether it's learning, playing, siblings. I mean, it's, you know, and then on the other side, I also have that other 
level where it it was literally my youth, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what it means to me. I think for me, it, it's, it's so hard to put in words, but I, it's just such a huge part of who I am, right? Experiences from made me who I am today, help me with how I raise and teach my kids. These experiences are so fun to look back on and think of all of these wonderful friendships that maybe I don't talk with each of you every day. I haven't talked to you guys in 20 years. And yet here we are all together sharing these wonderful memories that we all have. How to describe that? But it's just a huge part of who I am, that it's me, that that's the show is in me. And I, I'm so grateful for that. It wasn't like a job. It was more of just a wonderful experience of playing and getting to be creative and laughing and being with people you love working with. And it was, it was wonderful. You know, Jim Jenkins and I used to talk a lot about storytelling, telling a good story. And I feel really proud that the show uh, was able to tell these great fun stories about kids and a little bit of values taught there and some great music. I'm just proud of the whole thing. I think it's a great show and it should be playing everywhere. <laughs> I, I think I, if you'd asked me earlier in the week, I would have a very different response, but because I went back and looked at uh, a, a few shows, I realized it is even more important now than it was 20 years ago because of where we are. And it's the mark of a really brilliant show that it was talking about really eternal truths, community, what the family means, what outsiders, how they help that and impact that, how to solve problems. We're, we're in deep now. And I, I thought I, I saw the show and it was like totally instruction. It was sort of really helpful and, and optimistic and cheery with, with that tinge of, tinge of like of reality on the outside. But we can get through this. We can, we're going to noodle, noodle dance our way out of this. We'll, we'll figure it out. And I think it, it really is, uh, it means extremely relevant now. And that's, that's, that's uh, unexpected for me. Yeah, um, I'll boomerang off of that. Uh, no matter, no matter what, what you feel about what is going on now, as far as what political camp you're in or whatever, uh, I see so much here in New Jersey of good, and I see so much of people are so depressed. PB and J. Whenever I think of that time, to me means a glowing, warm feeling inside of me that is forever positive, and it is a moment in time working with masters of their craft, all of them, to know that the good, the positive, the warm glow of that time still exists today in whatever challenges we're going through right now. And I can't help but every single time the words PB and J flash on in my head, but have a smile on my face. So what more can you ask for? <laughs> and and um, Jim, I mean, the guy that created all, what do you mean to you? Well, a lot of what I was going to say has already been said. So. <laughs> uh, stupid. No, um, sorry. <laughs> said, but um, I'll I'll say um, uh, uh, to be able to dig uh, deep with with writers, and then it goes forward into. What, what the actors bring to it and the music brings and the sound effects and all these things to try to um, uh, say stuff that will always be valuable. You know, things, I'll call it the wisdom of the ages um, and yet don't ever get caught preaching, you know, to really try to do it where it's fun to listen to and makes you laugh or a song, an earworm that you can't get out of your head. All that is the mission. And to do it, hopefully, to where whatever you made will be as relevant 30 years later. And um, I agree with many things that were just said about this show is needed now, maybe more than it's ever been needed. We, we are really divided 
and this notion of kindness and goodness and together we can solve our problems any problem that's a that's a big deal right now and so, um i don't know let's make some more so current project what are you guys all up to you this is what i'm doing right now this which is great well i'm happy to be a project <laughs> I'm doing a lot of promos for Nick Jr. So I uh, have a home studio set up. So I'm able to work that way, which is lucky. I guess, you know, uh, that's kind of it. <laughs> the promos and auditions and whatnot. There's always something going on in the promo world. So that's good. Adam and Janelle, what are you guys up to? Um, what am I up to? So uh, I've been acting for the last... Uh, the, two and a half decades or something like that. I've been doing a bunch of TV shows. I'm going to be on a show called LA's Finest. It should be out on Spectrum now. Um, season one is being shown on Fox. It stars Jessica Alba and Gabrielle Union. And I'm, I'm one of the bad guys of season two. Um, and uh, I've been writing a lot. I sold a pilot last year with my writing partner. And we are doing a co We're actually doing an animated project right now. Um, and, and now during quarantine, my like full-time job is TikTok, where, where, where I just hit 2 million followers. Wow. wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so that has been taking over my life during, during the shutdown. Yeah, actually, there's a cartoon series that I'm, we just started a sixth season for, Bubble Guppies. Um, nice. And that has been, they stopped that for a few years and brought it back. It's amazing. So we're able to do that now too, which is. I, um, I just became a teacher at home for my first grader um, with COVID going on. So I guess now I have a job. Um, I, I live in Southern California. So I just, we love going to the beach. We go to the beach as often as we can. And, you know, I, I don't know. I <laughs> work with a vocal coach still and just sing at various opportunities that I'm asked to sing. So that's my life and I love it. <laughs> so Fred and Dan. Yeah, we keep talking about doing doing something together. Um, I, I, I'm do my own, well, have been doing performances and, but I'm a sound nerd. I've gotten way, way into sound and so the anthropology of sound and, and I do lectures at universities and things like that. I, I love all that. And, just looking for a good excuse to get in the room with Dan Hopefully again. Hopefully the next time you guys get to do all of this, we will, I'll be there with you guys. Well, I just want to thank you guys for like letting me do this. I mean, you guys, you guys are like my friends. So to get this together was really cool. It, it was so cool. I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody, but for me, this is like the coolest thing ever. And Bob, I can't thank you enough for, for putting this together and getting us all on Zoom. It's, it's just such, I, I will remember this forever. And I'm so glad we're doing this. It's just so awesome. And I just say, it's so great to see every single one of you. Thank you. It's yeah. so good to see your faces. Thanks for doing this, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Thank you so much. It's great to see everyone. I can't believe it. Everybody looks great. And uh, I miss all of you. Love to, love to everyone and love to your families and stay healthy. Love you guys. And to you guys. See you guys later. Bye. Mwah. The DJ Bob Show. Pop culture, past and present.